Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or even see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. You are invited to read along with us, either in unison or responsibly by the half verse. Alleluia, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord, they are studied by all who delight in them. Full of majesty and splendor is the work of the Lord. Whose righteousness endures forever. Gracious and full of compassion is the Lord. Whose marvelous works are to be remembered. The Lord gives food to the God-fearing. And is ever mindful of the covenant. The Lord has shown the chosen people works of power in giving them the lands of the nations. The hands of the Lord work faithfulness and justice. All the commandments of the Lord are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. Because they are done in truth and equity. The Lord sent redemption to the chosen people, commanding the covenant forever. 
Holy and awesome is the name of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever. of Mark. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he had taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept ask on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, if you had read the lectionary ahead of time, you might have realized that we've skipped one of the readings. Um, and if you've read the lectionary ahead of time, you might have said, well, of course they skipped that one. It has nothing to do with us. Um, but it has so much to do with us that I didn't want it to just go past you. And since you don't have it in your hands necessarily in a bulletin insert to refer back to, um, I wanted to make sure you paused and paid attention. So I decided I was going to read it this week. This reading is from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. It's his first letter to them. And as he writes them, he writes, it's very clear that he's writing in response to a letter that they wrote to him in the first place. There is, back in chapter 7, he starts a series of um, now concerning the things that you wrote to me about, is what he says back then. And this is the third instance of that now concerning as he addresses the different issues that this early Christian community is struggling with. They're trying to figure out what does it mean? They have been led, they don't have a Bible, a New Testament to turn to. They're, Paul's writing it to them. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how do we sort through the things that we know and the things that we have discovered in this new faith and this new way of following God. And so one of the issues that's facing them is meat sacrificed to idols. Hot topic. Um, it was then. In Corinth, this Gentile city, um, this Roman city, it's, it's this place where almost all the meat that's available has gone through the, um, the temple circumstances where meat is either 
um, it, it goes one of three ways. It is off burn up as an offering to a pagan god, or it's left as payment to the priests of the pagan god, or then it is sold, what's left over then is sold in the marketplace, or it's used for a feast there at the temple. All important things wrapped around these feasts, around this, and, and it's impossible to buy meat. Um, and so you have this challenge of these new believers, and it's pretty clear from this that this is not the Jewish believers who had been a part of this because it's not an issue of clean or unclean. It's an issue here of we, this is our whole old way of life. This was our way of being. This is, this is what we have stepped away from, and every time we get into this, it pulls us back. Um, we might know in our head that there is no such thing as other gods, but do we know in our heart? And so you have a group that's been hearing Paul preach about the freedom from law, um, the freedom in Christ, that we are, um, we are now agents who have been saved by grace and offer grace. And so we have some who have grasped that fully and say, we have this knowledge and the rest of these trying to hold us back. We can be out in this world and we can go to these feasts with others and share who we are and this freedom that we have. But if we lock ourselves away from that, maybe we can't do that so well. But these others in this church keep jabbing at us and saying, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. That's meat sacrifice to idols. And people, it seems like they wrote to Paul about their knowledge. We all know that there is no such thing as idols. We all know that there's only one God. So tell these others to get off our backs. And so here's Paul's response to them. A reading from the first letter to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat, as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Paul goes on to continue to write about the freedom that he has as an apostle, this total freedom. Um, and he talks about this, though, in the context of relationships of our relationship one with another in the context of the most important knowledge, the knowledge of a relationship of love. This then leads on in as he continues to expand on this in the different ways that this early church is squabbling with each other, calling them to this knowledge of love. Having great head knowledge puffs you up, but love builds up. 
And it leads him all the way to that first Corinthians 13 chapter, which we're so used to hearing read at weddings about love, being patient and kind. And Paul is not talking about a couple. Paul is totally talking about a church that's squabbling with each other about how to live. About Paul is totally talking to people who think that they know so much better and that everybody else better just let go. Although Paul also talks to those who he describes as having weak consciences. Um, he never calls the other ones the strong. It's the knowledgeable and the weak. Um, but he talks to the weak and says, watch. Are they doing it with thankful hearts? Are they eating with thanksgiving to God? Do not complain about what they do. For we can give thanks to God when we eat and when we don't eat. And Paul talks about his total freedom in Christ to let go of anything, to take on anything in order that others might know God's love. In order that the body of Christ, our relationships might be built up. And that is the authority, that's the only authority we have as believers. Is that no matter what we do, we do it in ways that build each other up. Not as in a ways to show off that somehow our theology has gotten so much more progressive and therefore we're so much better than all those other backwards Christians who just don't get it. But do what is what we're saying and what we're doing, is it building up relationship? Jesus walks into that synagogue on that um, Sabbath day and begins to teach and they go, oh, this authority. And that's what that whole story is about, Jesus' authority. And it's authority that's not from this world. It's an authority that was steeped in relationship. It was steeped in Jesus' relationship with God, his relationship with his learning, with what he was teaching, his relationship with the heart of it all being about love for each other. And so there is that disruption in the synagogue, and Jesus builds up. He calls out that disruption, silent, silence, be silent. And he heals, and he restores. And people recognize an authority in that loving action. It is the same kind of loving action that Paul calls that first church in Corinth to. All that you do, we have all kinds of freedom. We are so free in Christ that we are free to make ourselves servants of all. No matter where you stand, whether you are the knowledgeable or the weak conscience, what you do is to be done in love. How do you serve the other? How do you build the other one up? How do you see what the other one is doing? as a way of being thankful to God. In this world today, we are so divided and so much of it is because of that strong sense of individualism, my freedom, my standing, my everything, my security about me. And we argue about you can't take my freedoms away and make me wear a mask instead of going, what is the loving thing to do for community? And we worry about our own standing instead of stopping and listening and understanding the conscience of the other and helping them to see the thanksgiving that goes into our hearts and our lives. Let us not be puffed up with knowledge. Let us find new ways of building up with love. Let us not stand apart and above a community that's seeking to follow Jesus, even if we think sometimes they've got it awfully wrong. Let us instead listen with humility and love. Let us offer of ourselves and our lives in ways that help the world see that authority and community only come through relationship and love. Knowledge puffs up, 
but love builds up. Meat sacrifice to idols might not be our issue today, but how we live in relationship to each other, how we live in relationship to our own theology, our own way of understanding, and how that plays out in our relationships to others, we only bear authority in our teaching in our lives if we bear that with love in our relationships. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, give to us and to your whole church the spirit of wisdom and godly guidance, that we may discern the times in which we live, that we may proclaim with relevance the gospel in all the world. By your spirit, empower all who seek to live in the full freedom of your love, living their lives in ways that support and nurture their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for rulers and leaders of people that they may have vision and not neglect the responsibilities put on them. We pray for all who plan for our future, for scientists, geneticists, research workers and inventors, for those who influence our minds through broadcasting or the press. We remember all who have lost vision Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who now influence the minds of our young people, for schools, colleges, and universities. We give thanks for the faithfulness of teachers and administrators and for all who make the education of our children possible. May they be guided in the difficult decisions they must make in the midst of this pandemic, and may they be blessed with new vision and energy as they make use of new ways of teaching and learning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for those who have revealed your presence and love to us, for those who guided us in the ways of truth. We pray for all who celebrate birthdays this week, especially Bill Burns, Gloria Freiburg, Larry Bailey, and Curly Washington and for those who celebrate anniversaries, especially Jack and Jody Mishy, You are invited to name your thanksgivings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember all those who are struggling with powers that overwhelm them, for the sick and the dying, for the caregivers who are stretched too thin, for those who have lost jobs or businesses or homes, for those who financial resources have reached a breaking point. We pray for all those who are facing challenges of any kind in their lives, and especially for those who have asked for our prayers. Evelyn, Monica, Troy, the Potter family, Kobe, Linda, Joel and family, the Owens family, Brian, Jean, Jenny, Janice, Mavis, Charles, Julie, 
Regina, and Teresa. You are invited to name those for whom you pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for your redeeming love and liberating power, that you free us from the powers of evil, sin, and death and open up for us the glory of your kingdom. We pray for all who have died in faith and are now at peace. May we rejoice with them in your heavenly kingdom. You are invited to name those who have died. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, Give us a deep insight into your ways and the ways of the world, that seeing with a clear vision and having the spirit of discernment, we may be able to stand firm for justice and speak out in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join me in the general thanksgiving. If you have a prayer book or if you want to look it up later, you can find it on page 101. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Now remember that life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. <laughs>
once was a strong group, quite vocal, who ate idol meat with the locals. There's no God but one. We're free to have fun. The weak ones just act like dumb yokels. The weak ones spoke out altogether. We're Christians. We'll act pagan never. With idols behind, new life we must find apart from the demons forever. To the strong, Paul replied very loudly, Your actions show you to feel proudly. The knowledge you shout ain't what it's about, for love is what speaks most profoundly. With the weak, Paul was equally forceful. Never nag at the ones with the forks full. They eat without fear, with consciences clear, and hearts that to God are most thankful. How to imitate Paul? Please don't worry. Idle meat is not all of the story. Puff up yourself not. Build up those you ought. In love, do all things for God's glory. All life this clear principle covers. Don't seek your own gain, but the others. To Jew or to Greek, no offense you should wreak, and hurt not your sisters or brothers.